Hebrews in chapter number two. We were on this verse last week, and I'm going to kind of build on the, the concept that we started last week and add to those things. Uh, and that ends up being a theme through uh, most of the book of Hebrews, this idea of growth. And if you remember, the very first week we talked about the book of Hebrews, we were in Hebrews chapter number five talking about uh, developing and growing into Christians who desire the, uh, the meat of the word, not just the milk of the word, and the idea of growing into a place and then going backwards to where you need to learn the first oracles of God again. And the idea of, of the whole book then pushing us forward to doing more than just trusting Christ. And if you remember, we talked about Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are you saved. And it's, it's nothing to do with works. But then the very next verse tells us that we are saved unto good works. And so the reason, the goal, the purpose of salvation is greater than just a, a ticket out of hell and a ticket into heaven. It's not just to uh, avoid the great white throne judgment in the book of Revelation. It goes beyond that, and God desires a maturity for the Christian. So we'll go back to Hebrews chapter 2, and in verse number 1, if you remember, chapter 1 was all about uh, the superiority of Christ. Uh, he is eternal. He's from the very beginning. He does not change. He sits on the throne. He's the king of a kingdom. And then God starts in chapter number 2, and he says, Therefore, so considering who Jesus is, he says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And I spent time there developing that idea last week. I'm going to build on that uh, this morning because every one of the epistles, without exception, talks about maturing as a Christian. If you go to all four of the Gospels, God himself in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, he gives these parables of the idea of, of growing and uh, increasing and maturing. And so all of the epistles, the, the gospels, the book of Acts, all of it is about being able to grow as a Christian and move down that road and the walk that we have with God. If you go to the Old Testament, uh, the idea of uh, the book of Malachi um, talks about, um, or Micah, talks about the idea of what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. So the idea of this, this walk that we live, it's all about growing. And there's all kinds of Christians who can tell you the salvation story, talk about the day they got saved, and then since then they've maybe even been in church ever since then. But just getting saved and then even getting baptized and then attending church and maybe there's an increase in knowledge, there's an increase in understanding, maybe you learn more Bible, you know more Bible than you used to know. But we ought to be able to look at our life, and there's going to be these, these things that we talk about today that hopefully we can look at our life and, and see, is there a, a growth that is taking place? And that's the entire book of the book of Hebrews. Anyway, uh, John chapter number uh, 16, if you want to turn there, John chapter 16, we'll look at verse number 33. I'm going to mostly leave the book of Hebrews uh, this morning. I'll come back to the book of Hebrews, talk about a few more verses here in chapter number 2, but... I'm going to go and bounce through several of the epistles, I'm going to go through the Gospels a little bit, just to see that God really pushes for a growth. John chapter 16 and verse number 13. The Bible says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, be a, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So God looks and there's, there's this tendency to live this life and we get into the world, we follow after the things of the world, and what God desires for us to do is to be separated then from the world. In the world there's going to be tribulation, but Jesus offers a peace. He's, he's talking about a, a break in the road that's there. Everybody in this world is going through this life and everybody's experiencing 2020 and everybody wakes up and it's a new day today, it's Sunday, and all of us, whether we're in church or not, we're experiencing today. But God desires for us to branch off of that and go a different course than the rest of the world that is around us. He says, I have spoken uh, these things I have spoken unto you that you may have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, would be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he says, we're, we're going to live in this world, and this is the world. It is our home for now, but it's not our home. 
we're just passing through. We are pilgrims. Uh, our citizenship is in a different place. We are heavenly, living here on earth temporarily. But we're looking, and, and God says this is the world we live in, but he wants us to live on a different plane. We sing that song, A Higher Plane. You know, talk about living on a, a higher plane, even though we're here. Go to Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3, and we'll look at verse number 1. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 1. I'd encourage you to, to flip through and find these because I want us to recognize that Jesus has a higher expectation for us, a higher goal than just being saved. And the goal then of salvation is this maturity. Galatians chapter number 3, and look at verse number 1. The Bible says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, and ye uh, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? See, the Galatians were having the same problem that the Hebrews were having. We look and when the church had just begun and the church is early, uh, most, of the, most of the church was made up of Jews at the beginning. If you read through the book of Acts, it's not until we, we get to Acts chapter number 10 and we've got uh, that sheep that comes down and all the animals and Peter's vision. And then all of a sudden the, the gospel goes through to the Gentiles using the apostle Paul who got saved in chapter number 9. And remember, we walked through the book of Acts. It was all Jewish. All of the disciples, the, the apostles, they were all doing the... The work of the Jews, you know, they're preaching at Pentecost. All the Jews were there. The church was in Jerusalem and all these Jewish people, all the baptizing was Jewish people getting baptized. And then it switches. And so we look in the early church was all about these Jews. And when they got saved, it's different than a lost person getting saved where we're at today. They're very religious people. They knew much of the, the Old Testament. And so they would know the law, they would know what the Word of God said, and then they would go from a religious Jew to a Christian, which is different than today. A lot of times today, you somebody gets saved, somebody starts going to church, they don't know the Old Testament, they're not religious people prior to coming to Christ. A lot of times they don't know a whole lot about the Bible. The Jews were different than that. They knew a lot of what the Word of God said, and now they are going into a new covenant with God. So Hebrews talks about then going back to those things, but Paul went to Galatia, and this church has started, and now he's talking to the Galatians, and they're struggling the same way. So just like the Jews were trying to go back to the way things used to be, the Gentiles have now gotten saved, and they're trying to go back just like they did to the way things used to be. And so Paul here is addressing, he says, um, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, and now, and now are now made perfect in the flesh? Are ye now? I don't know why I have a hard time reading that sentence. Are ye now made perfect in the flesh? So Jesus, he talks about how we're, we're on this road together, and he wants us to have a divergence. He wants us to branch off of the road that is usually taken. He talks about this broad path. He talks about a narrow path. And as we get off of that broad path and begin on a narrow road, what the Galatians had done is, Paul says, you're so foolish because you keep trying to come back to this broad path and be made perfect or to mature because of the flesh, to go and do the best that you can to mature yourself rather than following after the things of the Spirit. And so they get off that path and they're doing well following the Spirit, but they're jumping right back in to the same road that they were on. Turn to Romans chapter number 8. Romans in chapter number 8 and verse number 29. Romans 8 and verse number 29. Paul's going to give us the vision for what, what salvation is meant to do. The vision for what salvation uh, is supposed to do is a, a full work in your life. And one thing interesting, when you uh, we talk about that Sunday afternoon Bible study, there's going to be a, a chapter on our standing versus our state. You know, our standing versus our state. It's the difference between justification and sanctification. Uh, when you get saved, that's, that's entirely done. But then there's a, a sanctification process that takes place, which is included in the idea of salvation. We don't just get saved and now we're, we're done, we're finished. God desires for us to get saved, which changes 
our standing before God, but then there's a sanctification that should take place in this life. Now we're looking at Romans chapter number 8, verse number 29. The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. When you got saved, the reason God saves you is more than just a, a forgiveness of your sin and more than just a, a home in heaven. It's so that you can go from where you are to where God desires for you to be. When God saves us, we go to God and we are sinful people. We're just sinners. Even our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says, and there's, there's none of us that are righteous. But we go to Jesus, we go to Him as sinful people, and we, we never th in this life get beyond the idea of being a sinful person, but God does desire for us to be conformed to the image of His Son. And so we look and when we, we examine then ourselves as Christians, we talked about it a lot with the, the Growing in Grace series that we did, those, those eight things where we add to our faith knowledge and temperance and we, or virtue and then uh, temperance and patience and brotherly kindness and godliness all the way down to charity. We, we add those things, but that's to look more like Christ. So when we look and we examine the book of Hebrews, what God desires for us to do is, is not just to go through this life as a lost person and then get saved and now live this life as a saved person without becoming conformed to Christ. If you look and you were to read in the Bible, the Bible tells us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so God shows us His desire for us is more than just salvation and now we're saved. It's salvation. And then there's a different path that we're supposed to walk on. There's a different life that we live. And God desires for that life to be conformed to Christ. So the idea of, and I know it, it sounds cliche and different things, and there was a big movement way back in the day, WWJD. What would Jesus do? But that should be exactly what defines our life. Every step that we take ought to be, how would Jesus take this step? How would Jesus have this conversation? How would Jesus treat his, I was going to say um, husband, but then I, I was thinking husband and wife. But anyway, how would Jesus treat a spouse? Either direction. What would Jesus do? How would he behave that way? When he loses his, his temper, we, we get to see the, the Lord get angry and the tipping over of the table. And yet he's without sin. And God tells us to do the same thing. Be angry. And sin not. We look and there's a, a way that we ought to step because something should make you angry. Well, how do you get angry about it? How do you behave yourself with those things? All of a sudden, there's a temptation that shows up. Temptation is there. And there's, uh, you think about uh, the book of Matthew. You read Matthew chapter number four and you, you see the temptation that comes to Jesus. And then you, you look at your own life and you step into temptation. How do you behave in it? We ought to take those steps the same way that Jesus did. And in my life, I ought to look at my life and say, I'm a saved person. When temptation comes, there should be a dealing with temptation the same way that Jesus dealt with it. Because I'm supposed to conform one way or the other. Most of this world, when temptation comes, they just indulge in that temptation. Most of the time when temptation comes in this world and uh, you, you look and you, you see the world that's around you, there's a temptation to get angry and to lose control. They just do. There's a temptation to cuss and to swear and to lie and to cheat. And all these temptations come. And the world has a way that they do those things. That's that broad path. But we're supposed to be on this different plane, a different road, conformed to Christ. So what did Christ do? We look and we see when temptation came, he began to quote scripture. He was talking specifically to the devil. He quotes scripture and then he makes decisions based on what the word of God said. And that's a hard thing to do. But I do know in my own life, if I am faced with temptation, if I slow down enough, and all of a sudden I'm just quoting the scripture that I can know, it's a whole lot harder to continue down a bad road while you're quoting scripture. You know, if you end up in a, a disagreement, the Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath. And I know if, if, uh, if my wife and I are, are at it, or if I'm fighting with a, a friend, or if I am in a tense situation, if I slow down enough to say, a soft answer turneth away wrath, and then kind of come back to that, I have two options now. It is very clear to me. Should I give this soft answer? Because do I want the wrath that's there? 
or do I want this soft answer to turn away wrath? What Jesus would do is he'd take that step according to what the Word of God says, and that should be my conformity. And I need to conform to the image of his son. That's what Jesus desires of us. Salvation is far more than a freedom from hell. His purpose is to make sinners out of saints. And we really have two options when it comes to salvation. We can get saved and we can have our salvation. Or we can get saved and we can have salvation plus all the stuff that God desires to come with salvation. And we look in the the culture that we have, even those who receive Christ. They seem to receive Christ, but they don't often pick up all the other things that go along with it. Um, you look in the, uh, the idea of a, a contemporary church movement and uh, the blending together of the world and the church. And there's all kinds of people that go to church and it's, it's like a, a rock concert and they've got the smoke and the, the green laser lights and all these different things. And people come in and they get great big crowds, but most of the time, uh, they do not actually grow as Christians. There was a, a big movement into that in the 70s and the 80s, and there was a big push that way, a seeker-sensitive movement, and they wanted the church to appeal to all of the people who are looking for something in this world, and they, they produced this, this idea of ministry where anybody can come and anybody can feel welcome, and that's good. But the idea was you could come as you are, and then leave as you are. And there wouldn't be any guilt for anything. There wouldn't be any conviction. There wouldn't be any uh, push to change or to grow. And then the same men that were pushing for that seeker-sensitive movement, they come back and they say, we've made some mistakes with that. Because now we've got Christians that can't stand on anything. There's no conviction to right and wrong. There's, there's no growth that is taking place. And they begin to look back and, and they say, we've produced a carnal Christianity, a salvation where... Even if salvation does take place, that's all that there is. And oftentimes there's no salvation that takes place. It's an emotional decision without any understanding. And so Paul here, he talks about it. He says, I need you to be conformed to the image of Christ through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, that's what our goal is. So we have two options with salvation. We can get saved or we can get saved and we can see all the things that God desires to add to that. You were in John 16 earlier. If you go back to John chapter 10 and look at verse number 10. John chapter 10 and verse number 10. John 10 and verse number 10. Jesus is talking once again. And Jesus talks about that idea of salvation. And then there's what comes along with it. And we talk about wanting to have this abundant life. And we'll see Jesus talk about it in John 10, 10 here. He says, The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. And if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you have everlasting life. You have eternal life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus came to give us life. And if you've accepted Christ and you say, I've claimed salvation, you have that life. But he goes on and he says, uh, in addition to that, he says, and that they might have it more abundantly. There's a lot of Christians, they get saved, but they do not have an abundant life. They have their salvation, but there's no maturity into something else. And a problem with that, and part of the reason that takes place, is because you can get up, and if you begin to preach about something, and if you are preaching about something and it applies to somebody, there's an offense that often comes. Because people don't like to be told what to do. People don't like to be corrected for the, the road that they're on. If you're raising kids and you're not doing it the right way and somebody shows up and says, the Bible says this about raising kids. There's, there's these walls that go up and now there's a, a defense. That doesn't work for us. That's not right. That doesn't work in our family. All these different things. And people are quicker to take an offense to a correction rather than taking the correction and going, thank you for some correction. Because if you, you acknowledge in, in every single possible way, when I correct my children is almost without exception for their good. Sometimes as a, a dad, I, I lose uh, patience and different things. I'm having a conversation with my wife and I will yell at my kids when they're just being, they're not even doing anything wrong. I just want to have this conversation and they're interrupting me. And now I say, get up to your room. And I'm having a conversation. And then sometimes you push too far, but most of the time when correction comes to my kids, it is for their benefit. And I, I recognize that as a dad, I see that. 
But then we ought to be able to go to the Heavenly Father, and when correction is given, recognize as good for me. That's the abundant life. That, that helps me. We ought to be able to go to the Word of God, and when the Word of God says your attitude is bad, when the Word of God says your language is bad, when the Word of God says there needs to be more honesty, when the Word of God says you should not be looking at those things, you should not be listening to those things, you shouldn't be going to those places, we ought to be able to receive that and say, that's what I need. I need correction. Because that's when you have salvation, you have life, and you're able to acquire abundant life. It's the idea of getting off of this broad path after salvation and getting onto a narrow one. It's the idea of not being conformed to this world, but being conformed to the image of His Son. That's all the goal of salvation. And when you look and there's a correction given by the Word of God, be thankful for it. When there's correction given, when the, the Word of God is preached, there should be a thankfulness for it. You don't have to turn there. The Bible says in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you look through the Gospels, you see over and over again, Jesus, he goes and he gives the invitation to follow him. And then they say, well, I've got all this stuff. I've, I've got all these things. And there's a lot of people throughout the Gospels that would rather choose to live the life that they were currently living than to leave that life in order to follow after Christ. And we don't know often what, what their name is even, but we know the ones who did. And we know the ones that chose to leave what they had and to go on. Peter was a fisherman and leaves it. We will forever know who Peter is. And I doubt he's the guy that sits at the gate and determines who comes into heaven, but at least he's got all these jokes in his name and whatnot. But we always will know Peter. And when we look and we see the new Jerusalem that comes down and you've got your, your, your foundation, you've got your pillars, we've got the 12 tribes of Israel, we've got the 12 apostles. They're forever named in heaven. Their name is written there in those foundations. And we look and we see that Jesus then he offers something that is greater. He says, I've got a yoke, I've got a burden, but it, it's easy, it, it's light. And the reason it's easy and light is because Jesus wants to do those things with you. But we have the opportunity when we get saved to take our own burdens, to take our own, our own path, or we can say, God, what, what's the path that you have for me? What burden do you want me to carry? Because that's what that yoke is. It's taking the, the burden that God gives you upon yourself and carrying that yoke, carrying that burden. But we have to choose it. We choose to go down those roads. The Bible says, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. See, so we look and my, my life will either be vain or, or will have value. But that's going to be determined on whether or not I am a saved person, or if I'm a saved person, who is choosing to live a life that looks like Christ. The Bible says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The Bible says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be as a, a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God doesn't just offer a salvation. He offers a different life to live. And the book of Hebrews is all about walking from that point of salvation to perfection going from where you used to be to where God desires for you to be and not going backwards the other direction. And the reason I believe God talks oftentimes about going backwards is because it seems when people get saved and they first come to church, there's a joy of salvation, there's a happiness, there's an excitement, and then the flesh begins to combat the spirit. And if we aren't walking after the spirit like we ought to, to combat against the flesh, which the Bible says is contrary one to another. 
we begin to easily go back to walking after the flesh again because that's easy. That's what is the natural tendency of a man. But God desires for us to continue to walk after the Spirit and not go back. But God paints two different lives that a Christian person can live. He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And I recognize I'm out of time. But we look in, to add to that idea in the book of Hebrews. And I didn't get to the other part there in Hebrews chapter 2. But he says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. God desires to paint an entirely different path for us to walk on. But we choose it or we choose not to. And as a Christian, as a saved person, I can always talk about the day that I got saved here as a young boy. And hopefully you can talk about the day that you got saved. But we ought to also be able to look at our life and point to the times where we've made decisions to alter the road that we're on. So I can talk about the day that I got saved, but there's also times in my life where I had to make decisions to jump off of my current path to get on to a new one. I did that a couple of times at youth conference, specifically the very first sermon I ever heard at youth conference in 2001, America, America, Jack Scott preached, and I made a decision that day. I'll never forget it. And it did. It, it caused me to change my perspective. And there were times when I go back to where I, where I was prior to that decision, I'd remind myself, no, I made this decision to be on a different path. I remember going to camp meetings, and uh, I remember going to the YMCA one time. There's several times in my life where um, I, I'm confronted with making a different choice and have to do that. And you ought to be able to look at your life and identify, that's the day that I got saved, and these are the times in my life where God really brought me over to a different path. And maybe you're at a point now where you need to be reminded of a better path that God has for you. And then diligently choose that. Work at it. And God tells us not to let those things slip because we get one life to live, this one time, and after this, the judgment. It's appointed on the man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So one shot at it. Let's be mindful of the life that we live. Is it conformed to the image of this world, or is it conformed to the image of His Son? Let's go ahead and we'll pray. We'll be dismissed this morning. Lord, I thank you for Sunday school hour. Lord, as we look at the Word of God, I just pray that you would convict us. Help us to live more like you. And Lord, I thank you for the blessings that you give us. I thank you for the comfort of being able to sit in the church and the freedom that we have. And but Lord, I believe oftentimes because life is free, we take it for granted. But Lord, I pray that we would challenge ourselves in prayer. I pray that we would challenge ourselves uh, while we read through the scripture to examine our heart, to examine our life, to examine the road that we are on. And Lord, we ought to be comparing it always to the image of you. Lord, help us to do what you would have us to do. Lord, we love you. Bless the service to come in Jesus' name.